Okay, let's get started. So today I'm going to be speaking about behavior-driven development. Uh, if you don't know what it is, I hope you will at the end of this talk. And furthermore, I hope you will also understand how to implement behavior-driven de development, or BDD, uh, with your Qt applications. Uh, independent from whether it is embedded, mobile, desktop, or now web, or whatever, okay? It should be a general practice that you can take with you on whatever project you do, if you think it is worth. My name is Marco Piccolino. I'm a developer, consultant, and trainer. So if you want, you can hire me. And that's my personal website where you can get to know a bit more about me and my work. So. OK. So in the last episode, I've given a couple of talks in the past editions of Qt Day and also at Qt World Summit in 2017. And the topics I've tackled there um, were clean architecture for uh, Qt applications. And if you have an interest in to understand what clean architecture means, you can get back to that talk. And that's a, a talk on application architecture and test-driven development, which is related to BDD, to behavior-driven development, but it's not exactly the same thing, and we'll see why. Also, that talk provides a first an overview of BDD, and uh, it supports on a homemade implementation of BDD, which is really a, a trick. In QDA 2019, I'll be speaking about UI development, so a bit something different, uh, but complementary. So if you're working on UI applications, and I think most of you are, um, you might also want to take a look at that. Today, as I said, we're going to talk about practical BDD. And these are the take-home points that I would like you to take with you at the end of the talk. The first point is that BDD can bring all the project stakeholders together around the same table. You can see a table here, no? People talking to each other with different roles, with different responsibilities, with different goals. But BDD should allow them to get together and share something. <coughs> what do they share? They share the same language using BDD. And we will see how this is possible. The third point is that you get some documentation for your project, if you practice BDD, which is living, a living specification. If me, it means if the spec specification changes, um, your program also should change, and it shouldn't stay behind. The fourth point is that BDD actually requires considerable efforts, patience, and discipline. But these are all parts of our craft, so it is uh, good that we, that we carry them on if it's necessary. And the last point is that the Cucumber framework provides a convenient implementation uh, of BDD for Qt C++ projects. So QML projects are not yet covered. So if you want to test something which is written in QML, uh, you cannot use this, this, uh, this tool. Cucumber actually also supports other languages, uh, like Java, JavaScript, Ruby, whatever. Hmm? A little bit of theory. So what are common project issues that we face in, in our work? Uh, the first one is that clients, project managers, UX people, uh, developers, testers, they have different ways to describe problems and solutions. No? Each one have got their own language, uh, which is a graphical language, which is a, a programming, which is flowcharts, and so on. No? And so there is, if there are different languages, like among people, there is room for misunderstandings, and also there are different expectations. I meant this, but you understood that. Uh, I wanted you to do this, but you did that. No? When this happens, we've got delays, increased costs, unhappy users, layoffs, <laughs> legal actions, and uh, basically at least some stress, right? So we want to av avoid all of that. 
So the question is, what if all project stakeholders spoke the same language? That would be nice, right? If the customer spoke the same language as the developer, as the UI designer, and so on, and as the account. The surprise is that they do. They do because besides specifying their role-specific languages, code, flowcharts, mockups, and so on, they all share a common language, which is natural language, the one that I'm using with you right now, right? It can be English, it can be Italian. Of course, there must be some common natural language, but usually there is always one, at least uh, English, right? So what does behavior-driven development do? It leverages the power of natural language. So it brings stakeholders around the table. Uh, he, it lets them discuss about product features and to find a, a shared understanding of what to expect from the product. And what BDD actually is. It was introduced by Dan North, which is a, who is a, a developer and a consultant, uh, because he wanted to answer this question, where to start in test-driven development. So I can write my tests before I write the actual code, but what do I want to test? Uh, uh, what, where should I stop? No? I could test pretty much everything in my project. The answer is a pretty obvious. So you, I should start from the business value, so what, what my customer actually needs. No? I should focus on the system's behavior, so how it interacts with the user. No? Uh, there are some things which are lower level details, which are not really interesting and that can change uh, also quite dramatically. But if there are some, certainly some core values that the user wants from our system, and we should focus on those. Uh, so I can say that if the system fulfills all acceptance criteria, it's behaving correctly. And if it doesn't, it isn't. So we have then defined, have to define clearly what those acceptance criteria are. If you want to know a bit more, there is this nice introductory article by Dan. So how do we start if you want to identify what business value is? We can start from user stories, no? User stories are, there are many formats, many, a long history in software development. A common format is the one that you can see there at the top as a, some role, some user role, for example. I want to do something so that I gain some sort of benefit. No? As a bank customer, I want to withdraw cash at any time so that I can buy the stuff that I need or that I like. Okay? The way we express these needs is very important because it will drive everything that comes after that. Imagine, for example, that I take away the part that says at any time. As a bank customer, I want to withdraw cash, okay? Uh, if I don't think about the fact that a person would want to withdraw cash at any time, I could just say I have a bank, there is a bank accountant, and he gives or she gives you the cash at certain hours during the day, and that's, and that's it, okay? I don't need an ATM to do that. That would be, it would be enough to, do, to have a system which is not an automatic system, right? At any time, let me, let me reason about the fact, can I have people that give out cash at any time of the day? Is that worth? Then maybe I might want to use an ATM or some other technology. And most importantly, why am I doing this? Uh, what do people actually, why do people, actually want cash. Maybe cash wouldn't even be needed. Maybe there is some other way so that they, they can get what they want at any time of the day, okay? Already these three lines help us reason a lot about what we want our product to do. And if we are the customer, we might already know most of this stuff. But if we are developers, we might want to hear this stuff and have it written down so that we internalize it while we develop the product. So use cases are very general, no? And a certain use case is, is comprised of different scenarios. Scenarios means flows of action. So the user comes, 
takes the money. What can happen there? It can happen lots of things. It can happen that there is not enough money on, on the user's account. It can happen that uh, um, there is some mechanical problem with the ATM, right? So we must find a way to describe all these scenarios. And this is a very useful and common template. The structure is this one. We've, we've got a given, so some context, a when, so a, an action performed by, by the user, and then some outcome. Given more precisely, given some precondition and some other precondition, there might be more than one. When an event occurs, then I must ensure that something happens and something else maybe happens as well. Uh, to give an example, again the ATM, right? So how do we call this scenario? Bank customer withdraws money. What are the preconditions? Given I have sufficient money on my bank account and then my bank card is valid, when I try to withdraw 20 euros from the ATM, then I should be given 20 euros. That seems logical, right? And then I should be asked maybe if I want a receipt. Okay? This is basically an algorithm, if you will, right? It's an ordered set of steps that can bring to a result from some input. And the input it comes through the context and the user action. So what are the benefits of using this kind of format for describing the functionalities of our system? First of all, the important issues to be discussed among stakeholders should surface early on in the discussion and not later when everything is already nice and implemented, right? For example, if we look at the previous example, not all necessary preconditions for the success are listed. You can think, is the data connection working? Is there enough money in the ATM, right? So we, we might want to add those here as preconditions. Also, it does not deal, for example, with the user's authentication method. Maybe that's important, maybe it isn't, no? We must think about that. Other benefits of using this kind of standardized natural language what are that we can actually link the natural language specifications to application code. And this is a bit the focus that I'm gonna show you today. Um, we can implement this kind of link uh, with tools like Cucumber or also, for example, FrogLogix Squish, which also supports Qt, but that's um, a commercial application, so you might want to invest in it or not. It has many more features, of course, than Cucumber, so you have many options, at least these two. Another collateral benefit, but for me it's a central one, of using natural language to describe your, your application is that you can build cleaner APIs because you reason in terms of user actions, business entities, preconditions, outcomes. So when you name a function or a class, you, you might actually start from this and take direct inspiration from this. So your function uh, should be called with Romani, for example, no? if that's the main function. Building things up from this. So this lang standardized language that I've showed before is actually called Gherkin. It's a, a widespread language and it comes from this Cucumber framework and from its predecessor which, which was called the R spec. In Gherkin, the user stories that I showed are called features and every feature is defined elaborating all possible scenarios that we want to support. That also includes scenarios which are unsuccessful. For example, we have seen the first scenario before, right? And that's a su successful scenario. But what happens if there are insufficient funds? We should think about that and see what we want to happen when, when there are insufficient funds. In this case, 
given I have insufficient funds, when I try to withdraw 20 euros, then I am informed that I have insufficient funds. And most importantly, I am not given 20 euros, right? That would be a, a big disaster if I had insufficient funds and I would be given 20 euros. So that should most certainly be part of our specification. And we must test that constantly at every iteration of our system or software or whatever that is. Then, um, preconditions should and can be specified not only at the scenario level, so within each scenario, given, given, but also at the feature level, because there might be some preconditions which are true and important for whatever scenario, scenario we are facing. Um, in this way, we can build a feature upon other features that we have built before. These kind of preconditions are called background. An example of background, my new feature is ask for receipt. So I want to define what happens when the user asks for a receipt. And for the user to ask for a receipt, there must have happened something before, which I synthetically uh, outline in the background. Given I try to withdraw 20 euros from the ATM and I am given 20 euros, and then I list all my scenarios just for the re receipt case, okay? Um, as you can see, in this way we, we can give origin to complex systems without too much effort because we reason step by step, uh, feature by feature, scenario by scenario. And also similar scenarios that share the same steps for example, withdrawing 20 euros versus withdrawing 200 euros, they, this can be grouped together into scenario outlines. Because if you pay attention, in the first scenario here, uh, I'm actually only testing what happens when the user withdraws 20 euros. So my system might only work when people withdraw 20 euros, okay? So I might want to test the, same, the very same scenario with different kinds of inputs and outputs. Uh, sorry, wrong way. So a scenario outline is like a normal scenario, but instead of fixed values, I can have some variables in it, okay? And then I put a table at the end, and I see that when I try to withdraw 20 euros from the ATM, then I am given one banknote of 20 euros. When I try to withdraw 200, I'm giving four banknotes of 50 euros. That's a very synthetic way of expressing this kind of uh, um, scenario. <laughs> um, going into practice, I've got a case study, which is this, this uh, side project of mine, which is called Comics Works. Uh, what are the features of this, which is a re real world project? It's a personal project, but it is already quite complex, so you can, you can see if uh, things could work also in your projects if they have a certain complex degree of complexity. Um, what I needed in this project is that it is uh, uh, it needs to support the same use case with different UIs. So I really want to test the system's behavior independently of what the UI does. The UI will sit on top of the basic system. And all systems should be testable without the UI. That was one of my requisites. And also I need a clear and testable specification because it's a project with lots of iterations. So I want to make sure that everything works at each iteration. And if, you do, if you're doing continuous delivery, uh, continuous testing, of course, this scenario also applies to your projects. So the, the product supports these features. Nothing more and nothing less. Nothing less. You can see them all here. They are written in natural language, so every person could, not, could understand what what it means to create a project, to delete a character, and so on, right? So this is an application which is uh, devoted to comics and comic creators. 
So these are all business entities, no? The panel, the character, uh, dialogue, the things that you usually find in comics. Uh, a little demo. Okay, so uh, this is the UI of the application. Uh, it allows you to uh, write panels, put in dialogue, what characters say to each other and how the story evolves. Uh, this can be done by creating characters, just inputting character names uh, like John, and Jack, and then uh, creating a panel, and, and saying that in this panel there is um, John, and there is also Jack, and uh, there it is a nice place, so a description. And then we want someone who says hi, and that shall be John, and we want someone who replies hello, and that shall be Jack, in a very interesting dialogue, right? <laughs> uh, okay, then once this is done, you can add many more panels to your project and then export everything to PDF. This is pretty much what uh, the system supports right now. Uh, okay, you get something like this, then there are there will be some formatting options, but this is basically what it does. Uh, oh, okay, so. Sorry, but it got closed. Yeah, we're on the right slide. Okay, so this is, these are the features. And the features are, um, I wanted to show you one more thing. The features are listed in my source code, so you might recognize Qt Creator here. as text files, plain text files. Huh? This is the cu Cucumber format. Okay, this is in my source code. I've got text files called .feature files, and each of these cases gives me what the feature should do. Uh, I've got lots of background here. This is the add character to panel. So I do my background stuff, and then I say, when I try to add a character with name Iron to panel, panel one, then the character with name Iron is added to panel, panel one, which seems a bit tautological, if you wish, no? So it seems that I'm repeating what the when step and the then step, but there is a subtle difference. In the when step, I am trying to add a character, and in the then step, the character is actually added, okay? So, now let's see how I can connect this text to a representation which you can share with your customers and anyone who doesn't, cannot read any line of code, or UI designers, and see how we can create this link with Cucumber. So it, Cucumber is a set of tools, and it provides this glue between the, nat the language, natural language and the application code. It supports several programming languages, as I told you already. And an important point is that the authors of the framework, and I kind of agree, uh, state that uh, the people who write these feature specifications in natural language should actually be testers or developers. So, the specification is done together with the customer, but then when you write the language, because it is a standardized language, it must be unambiguous at some level. So, uh, so that, this is the reason why you want to write 
that textual file and you also want to write then the glue code because you must make sure that your glue code does what the specification uh, says. The Cucumber C++, which is one of Cucumber's implementations, uh, allows you to write step definitions in C++, of course, and it supports several testing frameworks. What is of interest for us today is the Qt test framework, but if you work with other testing frameworks, it should work just as well. Uh, also, it requires Cucumber Ruby, just because of the way it is implemented, so you should have that, that as well on your system. And very important, right now to work, your Cucumber Ruby should be that version or less, because otherwise it will not work. The newer ver versions 2.x and 3.x are not yet supported and should be supported when Ruby 4 comes out. There you, can, you find plenty of ins installation instructions and simple examples that you can try out before diving into your, your project. So taking one example from the ComicsWorks project, we start from this simple feature which is create project. Okay, I've got my high level description which is the user story and then I've got a, a successful scenario. So given no project with name project one exists, when I try to create a project with ID project one, then the project with ID project one is created. Already here you can spot an inconsistency. What is that? The inconsistency is that in the first line I'm, I wrote name project one, and in the second and third line I wrote ID project one, okay? This kind of detail is easier to grasp in natural language rather than when it is buried in code. Here we've got a fixed version where we have ID project one in all lines. And this is uh, how we actually run our test. So with Cucumber CPP, we are able to uh, run this simple program which is called Step Definitions that I will show you later. Then launch Cucumber. It takes my text file, it parses it, does all its magic, and then in the end it says uh, whether it is successful or not. If I get no errors, uh, like this, it means it is successful, and you will get a, a nice green print on your screen, okay? We'll dig deeper into this in a minute. On the contrary, if my test fails, I will get something which might be familiar if you already use Qt test, which is this kind of output that you see between asterisks, which tells you what actually what test failed. And you can contextualize this failure to the first step, so the, the context, given no project with ID project one exists. It means that that particular step didn't pass. So there must be something in my code which, which is uh, out of place. How do I write a step definition that can link my natural language to my code? You can see an example here. So I've got uh, a string which is passed to a macro, which is called QuickStep. In this string, I can have regular expressions for those variables that I showed you before. So if you, I want to pass value down to my code, which is usually the case, because I have functions with arguments, right? So what I first do is to unify that regular expression to a QString object of name workspace ID, workspace ID, here. Then I will create this object, which basically only contains my application state. So it is all the state that I need in my application uh, to be uh, to pass or fail this test. 
then uh, this is the actual test. So I create a Boolean variable, and I, I want to see that my workspace actually doesn't exist because I want to create a new one. Okay. So I just use a QVerify macro, which is a macro from Qt test. If you use another test framework, you will have other kinds of micros to do this kind of verification. OK, what here is written as QC step could also be written as given when then. These are mat macros that are supported by the framework. But to me, they are less convenient because when I want to reuse the same step either as a given or, or as, a, as a precondition or as an action, uh, I don't want to make this difference. So I usually use this gen more general macro. Uh, mm, OK, and these two points we have already seen. Now, getting back to this uh, scenario scope here. It is basically a very simple structure that uh, has got the Q application in it, uh, has got a Q variant map with uh, the results of my actions. So the, if you will, like if you have got some return message, some payload that comes back from your actions, you will want to store it into something like this. Uh, then this is an object that I use to trigger uh, system actions, like a messaging system. Uh, you can have your function calls here, whatever you, your architecture dictates. And here I've, I've got a register of business entities because I want in my test to access the state of those entities maybe. So what you, you put in this structure depends a lot on uh, the structure of your code and your application. But basically, you should at least uh, hold a reference to the Q, applic Q core application. Uh, right. Then, if we look at the other two step definitions, so this is the when step, when I try to create a project, and this is the then step. Then the project with the ID is created. OK. What happens here? Again, we, we capture some variables with regex. Then, since we've got an asynchronous call here, we can use a QSignalSpy, which is an object that also comes from the Qt test and allows you to do asynchronous programming with uh, Qt signals and slots. Um, so I want to capture the result asynchronously. I launch my action, so create project with the project ID, uh, with the workspace ID, and uh, I wait whatever is needed, and then I capture the result in this object. Okay, why do I do this? Because in the next step, then I want to have access to this object and see if it compares some value that I wanted to match. This is what I'm doing here, so I'm comparing that the workspace ID that was passed in this action is actually the, the ID that my current project has. Okay? This for me is that this test is passed because the, my project was created with the ID that I wanted. So, a bit of hands on now. We start from the test runner. As I showed you before, uh, for the test runner to work, I need an executable, which I call step definitions. You can call it whatever you like, actually. Uh, this executable is part of our Qt project, and I will show you uh, how it is um, made in a second. So. Um, I need to use the dev null, so this, this is on, uh, on Unix systems. On, um, on Windows systems, I haven't tried uh, Cucumber CPP, so it might be a slightly different, but you can check it in the documentation. It's, it's, uh, it's written there. So I run my step definitions, okay, and then I launch Cucumber. 
and I get this very, very long output. Why is it so long? It is so long because it has tested all the functions of my applications, on all the features of my application. It is 15 scenarios and 131 steps. Of course, many of these steps are used from feature to feature and from scenario to scenario. So the unique steps are actually less. But if we browse through the output, we can see that uh, for each feature, um, all the steps are run, and there is um, a reference to the actual step implementation in the source code. And it is green because the step has successfully passed. OK. And this is done for all the features in my project. If I wanted to see what happens when, when uh, a, f um, a, feature, a step fails, I just make this modification here. For example, I just take away the negation and I verify that the worst space exists. Since it doesn't exist, this will fail. I build my project again. Voila. Get back here, do the same trick. Ah, and some red appears, right? So of all these steps, one step failed, and two were skipped just because these steps come after the one that failed. So there was no point in, in, uh, in checking them. If I inspect my output, I'll find the culprit, which is create project, the one that we modified. Uh, and I see that it fails here. OK, so I can get, go to my source code, to my test, first of all, and see why it failed. OK. So we, with a single click, I can check the, the status of my application. Then to, to give a bit more detail about how this uh, executable is structured, um, there is not really too much about it. I, I will just compile my Cucumber CCP with the building structures which are, which are provided on the, on the website. Then I will import some header here and all the classes that I need for my project, for example, in this case, QTest and QSignalSpy for uh, the QTest framework. I will import my business entities and use cases or whatever your source code is. This is the way I structure my code, but yours might be well different. And, uh, and then there is this uh, struct that we were talking about. Here there are some operator overloads, which uh, probably are not really needed in this kind of steps. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and then, as you can see, it's just a matter of uh, creating all our glue code between the natural language and the system's functionality. Of course, this is the most critical part in this whole process because here is what bad things can happen. You must make sure that your natural language specification actually matches what you're doing with your API. And that is hard. No? Um, this is why the more your API is similar to what is written in the natural language sentence, the less errors you might make. Okay? And this is also why this part should be uh, written by developers or testers which are aware of, uh, of uh, well, even because it's not so easy code. And if it is JavaScript, maybe it's easier. If it is C++, we know there are many subtleties that are very uh, specific and you should be a, a programmer. If you ask about the warnings 
for the macros, uh, I haven't really looked into it. It's something related to to the Cucumber CPP implementation. So, uh, mm, yeah, it should be investigated and uh, and sign and uh, notified to develop to the developers. Uh, so as you can see, this file is pretty long. We are covering many steps, uh, so it's like 550 lines. And of course, this is a liability because this is code that you have to maintain. Okay, uh, it's a useful code, hopefully, but uh, it forces you to do more work that you usually do when you just write your application and maybe your unit tests, okay? So you, you must know bef this beforehand, and if you have a dedicated res resource, a dedicated person that can do this better, otherwise you have to put that into your activities planning. Um, then, unfortunately, yes, the screen is a bit small here, so it's very hard to to show the project structure. Uh, I might just do it on the, um, on the file system. <laughs> it works easier. So this is my up-level Qt project. I've got my features folders with these text files. I can open each of these text files in a plain text editor, and it, it will just work. Okay, if your text editor has got a Gherkin syntax highlighting, that's also another help because your keywords are highlighted. The Gherkin supports keywords for several languages, so if you're writing your specification in Italian, that will also work. Um, so, my feature files. Then here I've got my step definition files with Cucumber, which is... Uh, compiled as a library here. Uh, this little Cucumber wire file, which is just telling Cucumber where to find the, the runner application, so on what port uh, to, to find it. Then the steps file that I showed you before with the macros, and my project file. If I want to look into the project file, Oh, no, this is not what I wanted uh, here. Okay, I've got some imports. Uh, I'm not really sure why there is boost here. Probably it's a needed dependency, but I can't remember. Um, or, it, or it's more likely a leftover. I should check. And then I've got all my, as I said, all my application code. So use cases, entities, or functions, what the classes, whatever you need. Hmm? And then I link my Cucumber library. Then going back to the project structure, the rest is really, depend, really depends on your, your application structure and your usual project structure. So you just need to add this uh, little sub-project and, and this feature files, and you can enable this feature in, in your code. Some considerations, as, as you have seen, BDD requires time and discipline. So there is no short-term gain. Of course, if you go for speed uh, in terms of days, uh, you won't be helped. Uh, but like all really good things in life, no? Uh, uh, the gain is longer term uh, in terms of maintenance of your code, in terms of maybe the relationships that you can, of trust that you can build with your stakeholders. Uh, because you have got black and white what the application does, and that's a sort of contract no, between you and your customer. Um, and then you could use uh, dedicated tools to propagate changes across feature files, because 
um, if you name, uh, for example, something in your feature file, then you and you change your mind, you have to rename that in all your features, right? So you can do this with a find and replace with a text editor, or you can use one of those tools that allow you to create uh, feature files uh, more interactively, and the output will be text text feature files. See how it works both for your organization and customers. I did use it on this personal project on a couple of um, customer projects. Uh, also in one case, not really to test the code, but just to explain to the customer what the application would do in a, in a very like uh, structured way. And that's another benefit. For example, if you are doing as you should always do, uh, some manual testing of your application. The feature file can, can serve as, uh, as a test script. Okay, so your tester opens the applications and with whatever UI is there, can try to uh, create a project and see what he or she gets. Of course, you're not testing the UI. You are still testing the application logic anyways. But it's a more integrated test. And yes, enjoy the ride. If you want to take it further, you can contact me, of course. Not so much for technical support with Cucumber CPP because I don't know it so deeply, uh, but there is this there are a couple of guys, of developers, on the project page on GitHub which are, who are very helpful. Uh, Paul Ambrosio and uh, Camille Strepovic who did uh, the Qt port and a few more. This is a book I wrote. Uh, it's got a little bit on BDD but not that much. And certainly not the Cucumber part yet but it gives you a little bit of overview. Also, however, it covers lots of uh, things about the Qt framework in general, about the graphical part, so you might or might not be interested in, in that. And uh, yeah, thank you, that's it. Thank you very much, Marco. Any questions? No? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, I Maybe it's my fault, but I think I missed something about how yes. to apply all this stuff to uh, the real code. So I'm definitely I missed uh, how to integrate all this together with, I expected to see some data structures in C++ or yeah. something like that. Uh, okay. Can you point them out? Yes. Please? So this is the glue. Okay, each one of these macros is the glue. As you can see, the first line is the natural language part. So it is the match between your feature text file and your code. So if I see this line in my feature text file, I will enter this macro. And this is what Cucumber does. Okay. In here, you're doing uh, three kinds of things. Uh, well, the, basically it's one kind of thing. It's just doing a, a test, like as if it were a unit test. Okay? Uh, how you implement that just depends on how your application works. So, for example, let's take this very particular point from line 33. I want to check that there are no projects with a certain ID, a certain ID that I captured through this, through this ID. Um, how do I do that? I look into a registry of entities, and this is already part of my application architecture. You should have a, a way to, to do this, which applies to your code. Um, I check that an entity called the current project doesn't exist. 
uh, and then, of course, this, this is what we changed before. I, I make a test. I make a test that it actually doesn't exist. And that's pretty much it. That's Hello, the scenario is, so this object is, is provided by Cucumber. And it is just a template that takes this simple structure that we see here above, that just gives access to the, all the context that you need. In the same way that when you run a unit test, you need some context, some objects that you want to operate on, right? Uh, so what is important here is that you've got uh, a QCOR application. This ensure, ensures that your application is created and destroyed properly. And, uh, and then you've, you, here you list all the objects that you need for your test. And this, you as a developer will know what they are. For my applications, these are the needed ones. But for your application, you might have just, it depends if you use message passing and uh, your uh, function calls return some, something uh, asynchronously. You will need something that supports uh, asynchronicity. <coughs> Otherwise, you just take the, you need access to a class, call a function, and read the return value. No? So you need an instance of that class and uh, a an, uh, way to read the return value of the method that you called. So you capture, you think what you need to capture for your tests, and that might grow with time, of course. And then uh, you use that in your tests. Just the same way as you, as you would for a cute test, because this is a cute test. OK, is that clear now? Does that answer your question? Any other question? No, OK. Thank you very much, Marco. Thanks. Thank you all.